The Walking Woman by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The first time of my hearing of her was at Trembler. We had come all one day between blunt, whitish cliffs, rising from mirage water, with a thick, pale wake of dust billowing from the wheels, all the dead wall of the foothills sliding and shimmering with heat, to learn that the walking woman had passed us somewhere in the dizzying dimness, going down to the Talaris on her own feet. We heard of her again in the carousel, and again at Adobe Station, where she had passed a week before the shearing and at last I had a glimpse of her at the eighteen-mile house as I went hurriedly northward on the Mojave stage. And afterward, sheep herders at whose camps she slept, and cowboys at rodeos, told me as much of her way of life as they could understand. Like enough they told her as much of mine. That was very little. She was the walking woman, and no one knew her name, but because she was a sort of whom men speak respectfully, they called her to her face, Mrs. Walker, and she answered to it if she was so inclined. She came and went about our western world, on no discoverable errand, and whether she had some place of refuge where she lay by in the interim, or whether between her seldom unaccountable appearances in our quarter she went on steadily walking, was never learned. She came and went, oftenest in a kind of muse of travel which the untrammelled space begets, or at rare intervals flooding wondrously with talk, never of herself, but of things she had known and seen. She must have seen some rare happenings, too, by report. She was at Maverick the time of the big snow, and at Trespinos when they brought home the body of Morena, and if anybody could have told whether de Borba killed Mariana for spite or defence, it would have been she— only she could not be found when most wanted. She was at Tunawai at the time of the cloudburst, and if she had cared for it, could have known most desirable things of the ways of trail-making, burrow-habiting small things. All of which should have made her worth meeting, though it was not, in fact, for such things I was wishful to meet her, and, as it turned out, it was not of those things we talked when at last we came together. For one thing, she was a woman, not old, who had gone about alone in a country where the number of women is as one in fifteen. She had eaten and slept at the herders' camps, and laid by for days at one-man stations, whose masters had no other touch of humankind than the passing of chance prospectors, or the halting of the tri-weekly stage. She had been set on her way by teamsters, who lifted her out of white hot desertness, and put her down at the crossing of unnamed ways, days distant from anywhere. And through all this she passed unarmed and unoffended. I had the best testimony to this, the witness of the men themselves. I think they talked of it because they were so much surprised at it. It was not, on the whole, what they expected of themselves. Well, I understand that nature, which wastes its borders with too eager burning, beyond which rim of desolation it flares forever quick and white, and have had some inkling of the isolating calm of a desire too high to stoop to satisfaction. But you could not think of these things pertaining to the walking woman, and if there were ever any truth in the exemption from offence residing in a frame of behaviour called ladylike, it should have been inoperative here. What this really means is that you get no affront so long as your behaviour in the estimate of the particular audience invites none. In the estimate of the particular audience, conduct which affords protection in Mayfair gets you no consideration in Maverick, and by no canon could it be considered ladylike to go about on your own feet, with a blanket and a black bag, and almost no money in your purse, in and about the haunts of rude and solitary men. There were other things that pointed the wish for a personal encounter with the walking woman. One of them was the contradiction of reports of her, as to whether she was comely, for example. Report said yes, and again, plain to the point of deformity. She had a twist to her face, some said, a hitch to one shoulder, 
they averred she limped as she walked. But by the distance she covered, she should have been straight and young. As to sanity, equal in certitude. On the mere evidence of her way of life, she was cracked, not quite broken, but unserviceable. Yet in her talk there was both wisdom and information, and the word she brought about trails and waterholes was as reliable as an Indian's. By her own account, she had begun by walking off an illness. There had been an invalid to be taken care of for years, leaving her at last broken in body, and with no recourse but her own feet to carry her out of that predicament. It seemed there had been, besides the death of her invalid, some other worrying affairs, upon which, and the nature of her illness, she was never quite clear, so that it might well have been an unsoundness of mind which drove her to the open, sobered and healed at last by the large soundness of nature. It must have been about that time that she lost her name. I am convinced that she never told it, because she did not know it herself. She was the walking woman, and the country people called her Mrs. Walker. At the time I knew her, though she wore short hair and a man's boots, and had a fine down over all her face from exposure to the weather, she was perfectly sweet and sane. I had met her occasionally at ranch houses and road stations, and had got as much acquaintance as the place allowed, but for the things I wished to know there wanted a time of leisure and isolation and when the occasion came we talked altogether of other things. It was at Warm Springs, in the Little Antelope, I came upon her in the heart of a clear forenoon. The spring lies a mile off from the main trail, and has the only trees about it known in that country. First you come upon a pool of waste, full of weeds of a poisonous dark green, every reed ringed about the water level with a muddy white incrustation. Then the three oaks appear, staggering on the slope, and the spring sobs and blubbers below them in ashy-coloured mud. All the hills of that country have the down-plunge toward the desert, and back abruptly towards the Sierra. The grass is thick and brittle, and bleached straw-colour toward the end of the season. As I rode up the swale of the spring, I saw the walking-woman sitting where the grass was deepest, with her black bag and blanket which she carried on a stick, beside her. It was one of those days when the genius of talk flows as smoothly as the rivers of mirage through the blue, hot desert morning. You are not to suppose that in my report of a borderer I give you the words only, but the full meaning of the speech. Very often the words are merely the punctuation of thought, rather the crests of the long waves of intercommunicative silences yet the speech of the walking-woman was fuller than most. The best of our talk that day began in some dropped word of hers, from which I inferred that she had had a child. I was surprised at that, and then wondered why I should have been surprised, for it is the most natural of all experiences to have children. I said something of that purport, and also that it was one of the perquisites of living I should be least willing to do without and that led to the walking-woman saying that there were three things which, if you had known, you could cut out all the rest, and they were good any way you got them, but best if, as in her case, they were related to and grew each one out of the others. It was while she talked that I decided that she really did have a twist to her face, a sort of natural warp or skew into which it fell when it was worn merely as a countenance, but which disappeared the moment it became the vehicle of thought or feeling. The first of the experiences the walking woman had found most worth while had come to her in a sandstorm on the south slope of Tehachapi in a dateless spring. I judged it should have been about the time she began to find herself, after the period of worry and loss in which her wandering began. She had come, in a day pricked full of intimations of a storm, to the camp of Phil and Gerard, whose companion Shepherd had gone a three days passier to Mojave for supplies. Gerard was of great hardihood, red-blooded, of a full laughing eye, and an indubitable spark for women. It 
was the season of the year when there is a soft bloom on the days, but the nights are cowering cold, and the lambs tender, not yet flock-wise. At such times a sandstorm works incalculable disaster. The lift of the wind is so great that the whole surface of the ground appears to travel upon it slantwise, thinning out miles high in air. In the intolerable smother the lambs are lost from the ewes, neither dogs nor man make headway against it. The morning flared through a horizon of yellow smudge, and by mid-forenoon the flock broke. There were but the two of us to deal with the trouble, said the walking woman. Until that time I had not known how strong I was, nor how good it is to run when running is worth while. The flock travelled down the wind, the sand bit our faces, we called, and after a time heard the words broken and beaten small by the wind. But after a while we had not to call. At the time of our running in the yellow dusk of day and the black dark of night, I knew where Philon was. A flock length away I knew him. Feel? What should I feel? I knew. I ran with the flock and turned it this way and that as Philon would have. Such was the force of the wind, that when we came together we held by one another, and talked a little between pantings. We snatched and ate what we could as we ran. All that day and night, until the next afternoon, the camp kit was not out of the kayaks. But we held the flock. We herded them under a butt when the wind fell off a little, and the lambs sucked. When the storm rose they broke, but we kept upon their track and brought them together again. At night the wind quieted, and we slept by turns. At least Philon slept. I lay on the ground when my turn was, tired and beat with the storm. I was no more tired than the earth was. The sand filled in the creases of the blanket, and where I turned dripped back upon the ground. But we saved the sheep. Some ewes there were that would not give down their milk because of the worry of the storm, and the lambs died but we kept the flock together, and I was not tired. The walking woman stretched out her arms and clasped herself, rocking in them as if she would have hugged the recollection to her breast. For you see, said she, I worked with a man without excusing, without any burden on me of looking or seeming, not fiddling or fumbling as women work and hoping it will all turn out for the best. It was not for Philon to ask, Can you? or Will you? He said, Do, and I did. And my work was good. We held the flock. And that, said the walking woman, the twist coming in her face again, is one of the things that makes you able to do without the others. Yes, I said, and then, What others? Oh, she said, as if it pricked her, the looking and the seeming. And I had not thought, until that time, that one who had the courage to be the walking woman would have cared. We sat and looked at the pattern of the thick crushed grass on the slope, wavering in the fierce noon like the waterings in the coat of a tranquil beast, the ache of a world-old bitterness sobbed and whispered in the spring. At last, it is by the looking and the seeming, said I, that the opportunity finds you out. Philon found out, said the walking woman. She smiled, and went on from that to tell me how, when the wind went down about four o'clock, and left the afternoon clear and tender, the flock began to feed, and they had out the kit from the kayaks and cooked a meal. When it was over, and Philon had his pipe between his teeth, he came over from his side of the fire, of his own notion, and stretched himself on the ground beside her. Of his own notion. There was that in the way she said it that made it seem as if nothing of that sort had happened before to the walking woman, and for a moment I thought she was about to tell me of the things I wished to know. But she went on to say what Philon had said to her of her work with the flock. Obvious, kindly things, 
such as any man in sheer decency would have said, so that there must have something more gone with the words to make them so treasured of the walking woman. We were very comfortable, said she, and not so tired as we expected to be. Fillon leaned upon his elbow. I had not noticed until then how broad he was in the shoulders and how strong in the arms. And we had saved the flock together. We felt that. There was something that said, together, in the slope of his shoulders towards me. It was around his mouth and on the cheek high up under the shine of his eyes. And under the shine, the look, the look that said, We are of one sort and one mind. His eyes that were the colour of the flat water in the Talaris, do you know the look? I know it. The wind was stopped, and all the earth smelled of dust, and Philon understood very well that what I had done with him I could not have done so well with another. And the look, the look in the eyes. Ah, ah. I have always said, I will say again, I do not know why at this point the walking woman touched me. If it were merely a response to my unconscious throb of sympathy, or the unpremeditated way of her heart to declare that this, after all, was the best of all indispensable experiences, or in some flash of forward vision encompassing the unimpassioned years, the stir, the movement of tenderness were for me, but no. As often as I have thought of it, I have thought of a different reason, but no conclusive one, why the walking woman should have put out her hand and laid it on my arm. To work together, to love together, said the walking woman, withdrawing her hand again. There you have two of the things, the other you know. The mouth at the breast, said I. The lips and the hands, said the walking woman, the little pushing hands and the small cry. There ensued a pause of fullest understanding, while the land before us swam in the noon, and a dove in the oaks behind the spring began to call. A little red fox came out of the hills, and lapped delicately at the pool. I stayed with Philon until the fall, said she. All that summer in the Sierras, until it was time to turn south on the trail. It was a good time, and longer than he could be expected to have loved one like me. And besides, I was no longer able to keep the trail. My baby was born in October. Whatever more there was to say to this, the walking woman's hand said it, straying with remembering gesture to her breast. There are so many ways of loving and working, but only one way of the firstborn. She added, after an interval, that she did not know if she would have given up her walking to keep at home and tend him, or whether the thought of her son's small feet, running beside her in the trails, would have driven her to the open again. The baby had not stayed long enough for that. And whenever the wind blows in the night, said the walking woman, I wake and wonder if he is well covered. She took up her black bag and her blanket. There was the ranch house at Dos Palos to be made before night, and she went as outliers do, without a hope expressed of another meeting, and no word of good-bye. She was the walking woman. That was it. She had walked off all sense of society-made values, and, knowing the best when the best came to her, was able to take it. Work, as I believed. Love, as the walking woman had proved it. A child, as you subscribe to it. But look you, it was the naked thing that the walking woman grasped, not dressed and tricked out, for instance, by prejudices in favour of certain occupations, and love, man-love, taken as it came, not picked over and rejected if it carried no obligation of permanency. And a child, any way you get it a child is good to have, say nature and the walking woman, to have it and not to wait upon a proper concurrence of so many decorations, 
that the event may not come at all. At least one of us is wrong. To work, and to love, and to bear children, that sounds easy enough. But the way we live establishes so many things of much more importance. Far down the dim, hot valley, I could see the walking woman with her blanket and black bag over her shoulder. She had a queer, sidelong gait, as if, in fact, she had a twist all through her. Recollecting suddenly that people called her lame, I ran down to the open place below the spring where she had passed. There, in the bare, hot sand, the track of her two feet bore evenly and white. End of The Walking Woman by Mary Hunter Austin Recording by Corrie Samuel